Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Gabriela Vedo Heda, and I'm a third year animation student at George Brown College right now studying game animation. Um, before I get started though, I'd like to preface this with a huge thank you to everyone or, uh, involved in organizing AlternCon. Um, it's a great privilege for me to be speaking about something like this, uh, mainly because I grew up thinking that no one cared about this kind of stuff, but then to see something like this come together is a really unique experience. Um, so my talk is preserving cultures through the power of games. So it's using games as cultural tools, and I'll give a little bit of background on my own uh, culture uh, and how it ex uh, inspired me to make this talk. So I originally moved from Toronto, to Toronto, from Winnipeg, and I lived in Winnipeg 10 years prior to this. So before having lived in Winnipeg Harbor, I was born and raised in Paraguay, which is in South America. And as a result of so much moving around that I've done in my life, uh, my Paraguayan culture has become more and more important to me as how I interact with tech, uh, in this case games, which is what I'm specializing in. Uh, my relationship with playing computer games um, has always been associated with speaking English. So I always played them in English uh, to make sure that I still had a way of learning English even after leaving uh, school for the day. Uh, so even if my, in my early stages of gaming, I saw games as an opportunity to gain knowledge about things that I didn't know that, that much about. Um, but that play for me was limited, so these were some of the first games that I ever tried. So play for me was limited since I grew up in a poor country, which means that certain games were not accessible because of price or because they were just never brought over to that particular side of the world. So I would resort usually to borrowing games, borrowing like really sketchy CDs uh, from people who knew how to emulate, people who knew how to transfer games from a console to a PC. Um, luckily though, uh, that's me <laughs> playing on the computer, but uh, my parents' uh, job required them to have a computer, so they had to have it for the uh, field that they were in. Uh, so I was able to use their computers to play games. Um, internet was very limited as uh, back when I was growing up, the internet speed was something like one page would take 30 minutes to an hour to load. So flash games were just usually never a thing for me because of that. Um, so at that time uh, that I did not spend playing games was spent outside uh, listening to stories, reading books that was relevant to my Paraguayan upbringing. Uh, in particular, our storytelling in Paraguay has uh, roots in the indigenous Guarani culture, which forms sort of the backbone of our identity and our traditions. And to someone from a country like Paraguay, like me, the term preservation usually means preserving the environment. By extension, because of that, uh, it means preserving the cultures and the lives of the indigenous communities there, uh, as well as protecting our own identity of the majority as a mestizo nation, so a mix of indigenous and European. In my family, our paths of jobs and works always branch away into different directions, so we're all very, very different in our career paths. So my father specializes in environmental work, uh, so he does a lot of preservation work there. Uh, my mother specializes in linguistics, so she knows English, she knows Spanish, she knows Guarani, she knows several languages, and she also helps preservation in that way. And then for me, I chose to specialize in animation and games, which is something completely new to my family, but they were fully supportive of it. Um, but what we all share in common in our family, even though our paths and jobs are widely different, is that we always come back to protecting our Guarani heritage and our indigenous communities in Paraguay. So no matter where we may end up, we're in Canada right now, but that doesn't matter to us. We will always go back and protect uh, that precious uh, culture and people that we have. And basically a couple months ago, uh, I decided to delve more into the Paraguayan indigenous identity through books that my family had passed down, preserved and owned for many years. But before I even got to that, I played a lot of games, specifically uh, Never Alone. So Never Alone was really popular because it brought on a lot of really good conversations about indigenous game development and how a game can carry on storytelling traditions. 
Um, and when playing Never Alone around kind of at the same time, I read a book called Genesis de la Raza Guarani, or how it's known by its Guarani name, Ñande y Picuera, which was written by a Paraguayan author, Narciso Colman. And this writer in particular devoted a lot of his um, work to Guarani literature. So this particular book is like his longest work, because he usually would just write short poems and short stories. And in this one, he compiles many Guarani stories common in Paraguay in chronological order from beginning with the creation of the earth and ending with the arrival of the Spanish. So his style is rooted in Guarani storytelling, but his prose is still uh, influenced by European storytelling as well, because he, while he is very uh, faithful to the Guarani culture, he does romanticize some aspects as well, which is a result of living in a post-colonial uh, society. Um, and in this book, he um, basically, he tells stories that all of us know, but in a more fictitious way. Um, and even in the afterword, though, he urges the Paraguayan reader, so he makes the assumption that the person reading this is Paraguayan, and he urges them to carry on these same stories and pass them down to the next generations to keep them alive. And in reading that, because uh, it was at the same time I played this game, I was kind of reminded of that book. And um, while they're both two completely different works, one is completely different cultures, completely different mediums, one's a book, one's a game, uh, but I found that even though they were so different in that aspect, they both have the same kind of idea behind it, which is a cultural story that interests the person reading or playing it into learning about that culture in a deeper detail. Uh, so in Never Alone, for example, you can gain level bonuses that give cultural insight videos. So you collect like these owl spirits and then during the game or after you've paused the game, you could go back and watch videos that tell you more about the Inupiaq people, their tools, their history, their traditions, and so on. Similarly, in Coleman's book, you can alternate between the main story that he wrote and notes he made at the back of the book that explain each Guarani name, their meaning the person, place, and animal uh, that the name belongs to. Uh, in Coleman's afterwards, he even hopes that the stories he translated from Guarani to Spanish, because he actually wrote it all in Guarani and then translated into Spanish, and that he hopes that they inspire the reader in such a deep way that the reader, who he presumes is Paraguayan, that he hopes that by reading that, they challenge their own identity and how they relate to the Guarani ancestry. So in a way, it was like an early example of like him urging people to decolonize by reading these stories. Um, and then, so when I bridged these two works together, um, I realized that a game is more than capable of doing what a book can and more because of the fact that you can get yourself immersed into it and it's a completely different level of interaction. Um, and immerse, uh, immersing the person in such a way that they can really experience those storytelling traditions. And from time to time I do talk to my dad. Uh, he is standing on the very far left there. And I do talk to him about how we can go about preserving our Guarani storytelling traditions. He explained to me one project he worked on, which he worked on with this community here, um, which involved bringing tourists into the Ava Guarani community of Akaraimi in Paraguay to generate profits that the community can keep for themselves. Together, he worked with the community shaman and asked what they can do in order to attract tourism because they wanted they wanted full consent from the community. They didn't want to take advantage of them in any way. They decided in the end that they would have people from inside the community present a dance to the tourists that were coming in. And that the, but while they were thinking that, uh, the profit was not the number one concern they had. So yes, they wanted to make money to go back to the community. But they also hoped that maybe the younger members of the community would see um, the tourists watching all these dances and that they would feel inspired by them dancing as well, and that they themselves would take up that dancing as a way to reconnect with their culture and as a way to preserve it. Or maybe even something related to the dancing it could have been another activity as well. Uh, so using culture in games should not just be f to bring profit, even though it's great, uh, even to be diverse, even though diversity is really important, but it should also be to leave behind a story that 
will pique the interest of the player into learning more about the people whose narrative that is. Um, so, for example, I have a very, very goth friend who we used to frequent like Wiccan circles. So, like they would <laughs> go have like weekly meetups, discuss like magic and medicine. Um, and among the regulars was actually a member from uh, Mohawk Nation. So in one of the meetings, they let him know that if he wanted to lead the meetings and talk about just Mohawk medicine, that he was more than welcome to do so. They didn't want to uh, make him feel like he was like an outsider there. They wanted to really uh, include him as well. Um, and uh, this individual, he was more than happy to share his knowledge on Mohawk medicine, but uh, he kind of had like a, he was a bit doubtful of it just because uh, he wanted to get a second opinion from his elders. Um, so he went, a week passed, so they went back to the meeting again. Uh, and they asked him, so do you want to like lead the meeting with Mohawk medicine? And he said no. And he said no because he talked to his elders. And his elders said that um, if he wanted to, he could go ahead and share the medicine, that knowledge. But traditionally, in his line of Mohawk medicine, that's not a knowledge you should share with anyone outside of the nation. Uh, even though they said that if he really wanted to, he could. So he did have approval from his elders, but he thought about it a little bit more and he said, no, I choose not to tell this to you because I just don't want to. So what this means is that even though culture stories are great, we need to keep in mind that not all of them are ours to tell. So you can't just go up to a group and be like, hey, like, I want you to tell me this story and expect for them to say yes. So there has to be full consent there, especially with groups that have faced and are still facing the effects of colonization and who they're doing their own efforts to preserve the story. So Never Alone was a wonderful collaboration because it gave the Inupiaq people all the storytelling power and the freedom to do what they wanted with it. If someone does not want to share a story, then it's not what, that's not something you should pressure them to share. I find that's the difference between a game that appropriates a culture and a game that respects a culture. And making a game with elements of a marginalized culture but not having any members of the culture involved in the narrative process, and what's more, not having a member of that same culture present in the game as a physical character, just further mystifies marginalized people and pushes them out of the creative process. So you have people tell stories that are not theirs and doing things with those stories that people who's story that belongs to, they don't really have a say in it anymore. Um, and games that give space to culture empowering and provide a different level of immersion, just like a book, a comic book, or a movie can provide. And they can be there, yes, to teach people who are foreign to the culture about its traditions. So something like Never Alone could be used to teach people about Inupiaq culture, but it can also be there to give presence to the people of the members of that culture. So people from inside that culture as well can look at that game and be like, oh, I feel represented, or oh, I'm glad that this story is being passed on, or maybe they just don't know about that aspect of their culture and they can continue learning about it. And sometimes these, these, game, like these kind of games do make impact and inspire other game makers to talk about their own cultures. So games like Wakameli, uh, Aritan and the Harpy's Feather, the latter which focuses on, on an indigenous Brazilian story. Uh, have inspired people like me and even in the Paraguayan game development community to uh, think about what we can do with games to carry on our stories. So, like, uh, I talked to members of the Paraguayan game development community and a lot of them are so eager to make games that are just about Paraguayan culture and sadly, a lot of them sometimes lack the resources or the funding so they can't do it. But especially with uh, crowdfunding projects uh, that is becoming more and more possible to do through crowdfunding. Um, and even games like Mulaka, which is an in-process game right now, and it's a collaboration between a Mexican game studio and an indigenous Raramuri uh, community, uh, provide people like me and people in the Paraguayan game development community ideas as to how we can accomplish this. And and there's so, and we have so many indigenous communities in Paraguay that we want to protect, and it's really amazing that people are looking to games to do this because it's such a immersive genre and something that can really last a long time, make a really huge impact. 
and my own way of um, making an impact in terms of diversity preserving culture is I've started a group called Pitable Gaming and we talk about things like this, diversity, um, things like this game here or these games there and these are conversations that we're bringing up, especially trying to connect with other game developers, not just from Canada, but also from parts of South America as well. Um, but in closing, so just almost to the end here, um, games are, a, I think, a great cultural agent to explore culture in. It should be something that is accessible to everyone. Uh, because it has such great power that you can pass down a story and hand it off to someone else and be like, hey, like you can learn more about this in this game here. And if they're interested in that game, uh, then they can pick up a book or they can pick up something else that will educate them more about the people whose story that is. And that's something that uh, Paraguayans and Paraguayans in general, uh, we think a lot about that because of effects of like colonization in our country and stuff like that. Uh, we think a lot about how we can preserve our indigenous culture and have it not be erased by uh, any like racism or colonization effects that still happen, uh, sadly, even uh, to this day. And I think that it's something, games are something really new that could really help like preserve all these stories that we're so worried about uh, disappearing. Um, but, that's all I have for today. If there's any questions, I can take some or, yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry, you had a question in the back there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so the question was if like, uh, like the longevity of like books versus games. Yeah, and at least when I think about it, um, yeah, that is kind of like a question that sometimes I've wondered myself. Um, within my own culture, if I think about that question, is um, games are something incredibly new to us. Uh, and in general, games are something really new. I think that longevity of books is something that I th it's hard to say sometimes with some books, but because others stay here for a very long time, others don't. Um, like in my own family, we have books that are like, 100 years old that have been passed on because we preserve it. So I definitely do think that books are something that we can definitely preserve. It's just the issue of a book being like a physical paper copy and it being uh, at the risk of being like easily destroyed versus a game which can be something that you carry on like a physical disc or in a machine. So it's something less organic than a book. Uh, but then again, for example, I have, um, the book that I mentioned here, uh, I have this book and it's about 80 years old now and the yellow and the pages are getting yellow and they're breaking off and it's literally disintegrating. Uh, so what I've been doing is I've been taking pictures and translating it and saving on the two like Dropbox because I don't want this book to disappear permanently. And there's people that have done that as well uh, with other books. And this book that I have is actually like, it was never officially published. So there's maybe two or three copies that exist in the entire world. So it's something that, because of technology, I can now safely preserve it, but if I didn't have something like tech, then that would be lost. And unless I like took a more paper and wrote it down again, but then that paper would age again and it would disappear, if that answers your question. Okay, thank you.